Alrighty, so I am super excited about this episode and today's topic, very near and dear to my heart, as you can probably see from the title if you're watching this. Um, but I wanted to quickly talk about and introduce uh, our guest that we have today. This is our first interview on the Barbell Lifestyle Podcast. So uh, welcome, Nick Licamelli, DPT. Super excited to have you on. Uh, quick background for you guys listening. Uh, I got to know Nick basically by listening to other podcasts and listening to him be a guest on other podcasts like uh, the 3DMJ and the Iron Culture. And those were really great episodes because as my background is in neuroscience for my bachelor's uh, in, in undergrad, that is something that's super interesting to me is like pain science and, and the neuroscience of pain. And so when he, they all started talking about how pain is perceived differently from individual to individual and stuff that we're going to get into today, um, it really just like opened my eyes to this whole other scientific world of pain and injury. And I'm super excited um, working with Nick now for I think a couple, two months or so. And uh, we've been working on some of my back issues, which we'll get into my history with injury and why this is such a important topic to me, but um, I'm really excited for him to just tell you guys about his perspective and what the evidence-based perspective on pain and injury actually is, um, and I think it'll be really eye-opening for a, a lot of people, and it's, I know it has been for me. So Nick, why don't you uh, introduce yourself, give the audience some background on you, your history, and your philosophy. Well, thank you for that intro, and it's an honor to be here, so thank you for, for having me on. Uh, yeah, so my, my background, um, like you said, I am the Injury Reduction and Management Specialist with 3DMJ, uh, so I work with, with the coaches, with athletes um, online, and I also am the Director of an Outpatient Orthopedic Physical and Occupational Therapy Clinic uh, in person in my home state of New Jersey. So... I guess a little bit of background. I, I, I took the journey into bodybuilding, how I think a lot of us do. Um, we get into the magazines, we kind of find different articles online, and we find some people that we think we want to follow, and we just take everything that they say for gospel, and we implement it in our lives, no matter how crazy they may seem, no matter how strict they may be no matter how many lives you push out of your own life. Um, you have to slam that post-workout shake, gosh darn it, after you train or your muscles are going to eat themselves, right? We all know, all know that feeling. Um, so kind of journey through bodybuilding, always wanted more, um, got away from those resources, found resources like 3DMJ and the like, and um, started offering some blog posts, volunteering my work, sending it out to a couple places. Uh, Tony Genocore, um was one of the first people to accept one of my articles. So I wrote for, for Tony for about two years. And then Andrea from 3DMJ read one of my posts from Tony's website. And she reached out to me and asked if I'd like to guest blog for 3DMJ. So after I pinched myself because I thought I was dreaming, I, I said, I would absolutely love to, to contribute in any way possible to help your cause and did that for about a year. And then they asked me to come on board as, as a part of their team. So it's kind of where I'm at today. I have a 14 month old daughter and one more daughter on the way due in, uh, in May, 2021. So, uh, life is, life is good. Life, life is going well right now. Um, I tell that story in my bodybuilding kind of journey because it's very similar to my journey in physical therapy and we're going to kind of get into this I think as we continue talking here but basically we're taught in school um, a very mechanical approach to the human body and pain and injury and if something hurts something needs to be fixed and we are that role to help fix people we are taught that way. We have to pass our licensing exam. So my school did a fantastic job of preparing us for what was to come. Um, and then you kind of get out of school and you have a mentor and you follow whatever that mentor says because you're thirsty for knowledge and, and for an identity in the profession. And so you take 
whatever your mentor says and you, and you, you kind of go with it and, and then you start to branch out a little bit and you realize, oh my goodness, just like we branch away from the muscle magazines or different forums or what have you, you start to get other resources um, similar to 3DMJ, but in the physical therapy world. So both my bodybuilding and physical therapy journeys have had existential crises where I start questioning everything. And, um, but that is, I think that's the important thing with anything to do with science or, or anything, because we always want to question. The second, we think we know everything is that's a bad time. We always want to question, always want to be open to things. We want to have our thoughts flipped on their heads. Um, we want to explore other opinions and that's how I think we continue to learn and grow. So kind of a long winded background of me, but that's kind of where I am today. No, yeah, I think that's perfect. And I think that's a really good uh, segue point to encourage the listeners today to be very open minded when we're thinking about injury. Uh, because I can tell you right now, uh, between uh, Nick and I's emails working together on some of my back issues, um, you know, to give a little brief background, herniated discs, back pain, uh, and recently a flare up was something that felt like a nerve issue. I get frustrated sometimes because Nick will not necessarily put a diagnosis on something. And it's almost like I want that like answer. I want the thing that I need to know what it is so that it can be fixed. And sometimes that's not always like the best thing to, or the best way to go about it. But, um, you know, it's, it's hard to wrap your head around that. And so I encourage you, if you're listening today, to just be open-minded if you are dealing with some kind of an injury and maybe you don't know what it is or multiple practitioners have told you different things about what it is because that might not matter quite so much as the process of getting back to what you want to be doing uh, with your activity. Um, so before we get too far into it without giving some definitions, uh, Nick, did you want to define what is an operational definition for an injury? Because I think that's a very vague term. For sure. And that's a great question. What is an injury? So it's poorly defined in the research. It's multifactorial. So think about a couple ways we can describe it. And a couple ways that it is described in, in, in the research is things like, um, you know, is it the presence of pain? Well, as we'll get into, we know that pain doesn't always mean some kind of tissue damage. And we know that people can have pain and still not lose any performance or lose any strength and still still function pretty well. So it's probably not just the presence of pain. Is it um, time off from training? Is it um, modified training? Is it how much time off is it from training? How much modified training is it? Is it only an injury if you go see a healthcare provider about it? Uh, so it's very murky uh, to kind of define what injury is. You wouldn't really think that. Everyone knows what an injury is, right? But if you try to define it and, and, and make it black and white, it's difficult to say. And that makes it even more comp complicated to figure out what causes an injury and how do we prevent it? Because we all want to prevent injuries. But at the end of the day, there are so many factors that can contribute to an injury. Hard to prevent slipping on a wet surface, you know, if there's dew on the ground on a Saturday morning and you're playing soccer. Um, hard to prevent that, right? Hard to prevent if someone kicks your knee with their shin. That's an injury, but how do you prevent that? Um, things like sleep quality, which I'm sure we'll get into here, you know, stress levels, hydration, nutrition, all of these things are at play. So it's really hard to put a definition on injury and how to prevent it. So for me, I try to focus on what the patient or athlete's goals are. And are you able to achieve your goals? Are you able to progress toward your goals? And if not, what can we do to, to change that? What can we do to modify what you're doing to kind of modulate your symptoms and, uh, and kind of keep you moving toward your goals. So that is probably the vaguest possible way to define injury, but that's what I got for you. <laughs> well, and I think it's interesting because you touch on the presence of pain. So, you know, how does that relate to whether or not you have an injury? And then I've listened to some of your other content and you've mentioned in the past that pain is actually can kind of be normal. And so I think that that's difficult for someone to 
differentiate between what's normal pain and what's pain that now requires me to, okay, now I do need to go to a healthcare provider. This is something that has kind of escalated into an injury. So is that something you can touch on too, is like what is normal pain versus what is pain that requires maybe treatment or rehab? And That's a how, really, do you, how do you help someone differentiate between those two, that two. As, as a practitioner? That's a really great question and, and a very important question because that's one of the things that I find myself doing is I'm, I'm very much, um, you know, I, I, I do promote this idea that pain isn't always damage and because the, the, the general theme around pain is that pain is damage. So I like to promote and possibly think the other way, but at the same time, I don't want to become only that way and then mislead people. So it's a great question. And what I would say is if you are having pain that you can't really reproduce or you can't really relieve with anything. So like if it's just like this dull, achy pain that really has no rhyme or reason why it comes or goes, it's waking you up at night. Um, you have numbness, tingling down an arm or a leg. Um, you have a fever any kind of loss of bowel and bladder control, um, anything like that is when we want to go see a healthcare provider in person, possibly get some further imaging done, further examinations done. That's usually, in my experience, not the pain that athletes are coming to me with. Usually these are things like, hey, every time I do this kind of motion with my shoulder, I get this pinching pain in my shoulder. But if I stop doing that, it doesn't hurt. Or it'll be a bit more nuanced. Like every time I do this kind of exercise at, at this repetition range, then I feel my pain. Okay, that's great. We have some um, uh, predictability of the symptoms. We can reproduce them. We can relieve them. That's a good sign. Um, numbness, tingling, not always a red flag because we can do some things to kind of reduce that. Um, but definitely something that if it doesn't get better quickly, we want to refer out. Um, so those are things to keep in mind. One of the questions I get a lot is if I have pain, what do I do? And usually I'll say, so say for example, we're in the gym and we're performing some kind of exercise and we have pain in our shoulder, for example, what do you do? Do you drop the weight? Do you go home and say, Oh, I had pain. I got a torn rotator cuff. I'm done training for the next six months. Um, what I would suggest is do another rep. See what it feels like. Change the angle of your arm a little bit. Change the range of motion a little bit. Maybe change the weight. Just kind of do a self-experiment in that moment. Um, it may help. It, it, you may have pain on the first two reps, but then the last reps of the set feel good. Maybe just have to get warmed up a little bit. Um, so if you do have pain, I would always say try another rep see how it feels. If it gets progressively worse, then we can try to modify the activity or, or modify, you know, some kind of uh, load or range of motion or what have you. Um, but I would say always try another rep, um, get a good feel of the, the way that it behaves, because then that will help if you ever come talk to someone like me, or you're trying to find other ways to work around it. The more that you can find out um, about the pain, about the symptoms, what makes it worse, what tends to make it better, um, the more you can find out about that, the better. Yeah, and I think this is a really nice way to transition into talking about what your process actually looks like. So, you know, someone's coming to you with this pain, maybe they've experimented a little bit around it, like you just explained, maybe they haven't. What does that look like mindset-wise when someone comes to you with pain or what they perceive to be an injury? And how do you how do you work with someone um, from that starting point? Because I think that's where most people who might be listening to this would be um, and maybe what they need to hear. Yeah, for sure. And the place I always start is usually not the body part or not the symptoms. I like to get to know the person a little bit. And Marissa, you and I, you know, we talked a little bit about ourselves, a little bit about your goals, you, your personal goals and and, and goals in fitness and, and things like that. And, and I like to paint a picture of the person in front of me. What is, this, what is this pain? What is this experience? How is it impacting that person's life? Because it's more than just a knee. It's more than just a shoulder. There, this, is, this is bigger. This is, these are thoughts about, am I going to be able to continue to train throughout my life? 
am I grinding away my cartilage to make my knee worse as I get older? Will I be able to play with my kids someday, you know, in the yard? Uh, all of these thoughts, especially for people like us who we're working out is more than just a hobby. It's, it's our lives, right? It's part of our lives. The threat of that and the unknown of something like pain um, can be quite scary. And, and, and I get that. So I want to, that's how I always like to start. I like to get to know the person a little bit. Um, because if, if they reach out to me, I know that they've tried about five things before, <laughs> before reaching out to me. They've searched on Google, which can be good and bad. I think there's good and bad to, to all the information we have, um, we have access to. Um, so there's a lot of free information out there. So I, I, I know very well that I'm not the first person or first resource that they're coming to for. So it must be, it must be pretty significant at this point. So I like to keep that in mind. Then once we get past that and we get into more of the actual physical, um, physical aspect of it, I like to ask questions about the pain. So when did it start? How did it start? Was this something that gradually built up? Like you started feeling it six months ago and it just kind of got worse, but then got better, then got worse and worse and worse and worse. And you thought it would go away, but it didn't. Um, there's that. But then there's also, I went down into a squat, bang, I felt a pop in my back and it's been sore ever since. Um, all of those, those situations are going to be a little bit different. Um, in general, usually if something comes on very quickly, Sometimes it goes away very quickly, but not all the time. Um, but, it, but it's good to know, good to know how, how the symptoms started. And then I like to see what provokes it and what relieves it. Because the answers to those questions will help guide us into the way that we approach this thing. So if it is, for example, we use low back pain um, with squatting. That tends to be an easy example. If someone says, I have low back pain when I squat. Well, what we don't want to do is stop squatting. If that's a goal of yours, if, if squatting isn't a goal, then we don't have to squat. But if squatting is a goal for you, then there are ways to, to modify that movement pattern to, um, to get you back to, uh, to, to squatting. So if it seems to be a depth uh, trigger, so maybe it feels good regardless of weight, regardless of RPE, regardless of overall volume, regardless of frequency per week, but once you get down to 90 degrees, you feel your pain. What we're going to do is we're going to try to modify the depth a little bit and see if that changes it. Um, and I guess we should take a step back and, and talk about, I guess, my general treatment approach with, um, you know, uh, Marissa, we've talked graded exposure and, and all that. So I'll try to kind of go through this relatively quickly. But basically the idea just to kind of set the foundation for, for us moving forward here is that pain is usually our body's way of communicating something to us. Usually I like to think of it like a balance between load and capacity. So load is on one side of like this balancing act and capacity is on the other side. Load is everything we put into our bodies, like, meaning reps, weight, step count, um, everything physical that we put into our, our bodies, capacity is the ability to recover from that. Things that make up capacity are sleep, stress management, hydration, nutrition, all those type of things. So ideally, as a new athlete, we would start at the bottom. And um, so I don't know if, uh, if anyone who's not watching the video, I kind of just have like a balance seesaw here and I'm starting at the bottom of the screen with both hands. Um, you kind of have this, the both at the bottom level, you introduce some training and some, some resistance, and then you get sore, but then your body recovers and capacity adapts to it. And then you push a little more and capacity adapts. You push a little more and capacity adapts. That never happens in the real world because we're humans and we live lives that are variable and changing. So if that ever gets kind of out of whack too much, um, you know, if, if it's kind of a perfect storm of you kind of pushed it in the gym, but then also you're, say you had a baby <laughs> about a year ago and um, your sleep quality may have decreased um, or you uh, got fired at work or heck, I don't know, a worldwide pandemic happened and you don't know if you're going to get toilet paper the next day. <laughs> um, all of these things can, can, can kind of, get put into play here on the pandemic it's a perfect example 
there was also a shift in the way most of us were training. Most of us were left to doing sets of 20 split squats holding a gallon of water <laughs> rather than doing our normal leg press, right? So the change in, in, in training, just the novelty of, of change can also kind of trigger some of these things. So usually pain it manifests itself from that balancing act. Um, the way that we approach that is we don't want to take time completely off. That's one of the recommendations that you may get from a healthcare provider is, well, if your back hurts, I would say don't squat for six weeks and then we'll revisit it, you know, six weeks now and see how you feel. The problem with that is if we go back to our model over the years of training, you've built up all this capacity and all this tolerance to load. And now we're just going to stop the load and capacity is going to drop down accordingly. I'm sure the back may feel better after you just stop squatting completely because it's not being challenged. But then after that six weeks, when the back feels good, how do we know where to kind of build up again because we just stopped completely? So what I choose to do is rather than drop it down completely, we take these baby steps down. And the first baby step in our previous example would be a box squat, for example, if, if depth is that provocative um, variable. A box squat would be the first step down. We try that out for a week or so. If it's not tolerated well, if the symptoms are still there, um, and we want to give it time, we don't want to just make a conclusion after one training session because, like we said, pain is multifactorial. So it could just have been a bad day. Uh, so I like to give it two to three training sessions, give it a good shot and get a good idea of how we're responding. If that doesn't work, then we can try to elevate the box a little more. Maybe put a plate on the box and go a little bit higher or try a front squat or try a goblet squat. Um, you know, any kind of tiny modification like that until we find a variation that we can groove and we can load consistently without provoking that pain. Once we find that, we're golden. Because now we stay there, once we get some consistency, then we slowly start to work ourselves back up the same steps that we took down. So there's not a guessing game of going from completely stopping to getting back into it. Now we have this stepwise approach of how to work back into it. So with our hypothetical example, if we say we regressed down to a, um, a box squat with a plate uh, for more elevation, and we're doing four sets of that. What I would do is maybe do two sets with the plate in the box and then two sets with just the box. See how that feels for a week. And then maybe take the plate out completely the following week. So we're doing all four sets with the box. And then maybe take the box out for two sets and have just a freestanding back squat uh, for, for two sets or the box for two and then no box for two. But you kind of get this approach. There's, um, we're not taking time completely off. We're more just finding a way to modify that, that movement pattern so it's specific to the goal movement, um, but, it, but it's not taking, not taking time uh, completely off. And that process is called graded exposure, where we gradually expose the body to that stimulus so that it desensitizes that alarm system, so to speak, of this pain. Um, and, and not to go down too much of a rabbit hole, but the alarm system metaphor really works well because the alarm doesn't really define what the emergency is. It just tells you that it got tripped for some reason and it's doing its job and it's just telling you something is up. Um, so if you, for example, um, are eat breakfast and an hour later you walk by a bakery or a McDonald's or something and you smell that scent and you feel hungry, you feel the sensation of being hungry. That doesn't mean that you're starving. It just means that your body is sending some kind of message. It's not accurate. We're not physically starving, but it's just sending us that message. Um, so the, um, the, that's kind of the idea is we want to, um, we want to kind of understand that pain is just a message that, that our body's telling us. Similar to if one of the, another example I like to use a lot is, um, so I am from New Jersey 
I can see the New York City skyline down the block from my street if I look, uh, you know, look look a certain way. When September 11th happened, um, there couldn't be a low flying plane that flew by and everyone didn't get a little bit nervous. We all got that response. Our heart kind of skipped a beat a little bit, but then we went on with our day. Um, but if I were to work at an airport and I send, I guide planes in every day of my, my job and planes are flying 10 feet over my head all day long, that response is going to be desensitized because I've been exposed to it. Um, another example is like, say, if I'm afraid of, of, of spiders, I have a pathological fear of spiders or heights, for example. Um, you're not going to throw me in a pool of tarantulas on day one, just like you're not going to put me on top of the Empire State Building on day one. Because what that would do is that would reinforce that. That would make it worse. And I'd probably be scarred for life. And it would be a lot harder to get over that fear of spiders or fear of heights. That's like when we push it too much in the gym and we keep provoking the pain. It's just reinforcing that pain response. What we want to do is take baby steps closer to that spider or go up two floors, feel our heart races, feel the, feel the stress, that response. Breathe in, breathe out. Let our bodies know that it's okay. And then once we kind of desensitize that response, we take another step up or a step closer to that spider. Each step that we take, we're expecting that discomfort, but we're going to breathe through it and our body's going to get adjusted to it. Similar to training, we want to meet that edge of discomfort without provoking the pain. Because if we keep provoking the pain, it's just going to reinforce that message. So we want to desensitize it, almost like the boy who cried wolf, right? Keep telling the people of the village, there's a wolf, there's a wolf, there's a wolf. Pretty soon, it's just going to be numb. They're not going to be, you know, they're not going to react quite as much as they would otherwise. Um, so the more that we can expose our bodies to that similar provocative movement pattern without provoking the pain, the more that we can show our body and almost give it a little hug and say, look, it's okay, champ. Like our back is not going to break if we do this squatting pattern. So I think that is the record for the most metaphors in any explanation or any answer to any question of all time on any podcast right here. So <laughs> you're very welcome. We, made, we just made history, everybody. <laughs> well, just broke the internet. <laughs> um, Nick, I was going to say, I, I love what you talked about during your process of how you deal with an injury or, you know, pain with a client. And you talk about, you want to get to know the person first, like first and foremost, because you want to figure out how that injury impacts their life, because it's a big difference between if they like to strength train just to keep up with general health versus someone who's a power lifter, because if someone can't deadlift and they're a power lifter, that's going to be a lot different in how you manage that pain. Um, but one of the things I was thinking about while you were talking is, you know, talking about back injuries and back pain is that is the general consensus you get from doctors and healthcare professionals as well. You should stop squatting. You should stop deadlifting. If that's what causes pain, then we're not going to do that anymore. And that can lead to a lot more issues. But how as, you know, Marissa and I are both coaches. So how would you deal with someone who a client goes and sees a doctor and they say, stop doing this. And you don't want to reach out of your scope of practice and say, well, I think you should. How would you maybe, what would you tell a coach who's in that position? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it's something that I, that I face every single day, every single day. And it's important to remember that um, I, I don't, oh, I don't ever speak as if I think I'm, I'm right or I know all the answers. I just kind of present my side as the best, my best interpretation of the current evidence. And I have no, I have no stake in anything that I'm saying. I don't have like the, uh, I don't have an ebook that has like Nick's five steps to back pain that I'm like promoting. Not that that's bad. I mean, people sell great products all, all the time. Um, but I have nothing, uh, I, I try to be as unbiased as possible when I deliver the message. And it's important to remember that sometimes these, these patients and athletes have good relationships with these healthcare providers. So if I just come in and say, ha, 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 like I know everything and that person doesn't know what they're talking about and they're nociboing you and, well, then that breaks the rapport that I have with my potential athlete or, or, or patient. So 
and there's something we can learn from everyone. So even the bad or not bad, even the healthcare providers that have different views, we could still learn some things from them. So I like to approach it as um, almost like motivational interviewing, where I like to hear everything that the patient feels or thinks and why they came to those conclusions. Um, the, uh, the, as far, I mean, in the United States, orthopedic surgeons and, and, and doctors, they are placed on a pedestal and for good reason, because they are trained extensively in surgery and diagnosing red flags and, and things like that. But it's not their job to, um, to kind of know the nuances of these things. It's, it's our job. It's the physical therapists. It's, it's the athletic trainers. It's, it's our job to do that. Um, so I don't, I don't fault like the, the, um, orthopedic surgeons or, or, or different doctors because it's their job to, um, to do surgery or prescribe medicine or get some kind of imaging done. Um, that's their job and they do it well. Um, I think when, uh, we put too much faith in those recommendations, um, I think that may be when, when we kind of run into trouble. So, so yeah, when, when people come to me with, preconceived notions about what's causing their pain. I don't ever tell them like, that's probably not true. I just like to hear their side. And for example, a conversation may, you know, may go something like this. Okay. I went to, went to my doctor and they said that I have, um, my, my probably have a torn rotator cuff. Okay. So then I say, and how did, what do you think about that? Like, what, what, what do you know about the rotator cuff? Like, how does that, what does it make you feel? And I say, well, I, I don't want surgery. Like I heard on the news that like the pitcher for the Yankees had to get rotator cuff surgery. And, and my aunt, my great aunt Tilly had to get rotator cuff surgery and she was never the same. And she can't even like pick up a pot anymore. So then you start to realize, okay, this is where these feelings are coming from. And so then I, kind of listen to all that and say, okay, I told, I get what you're saying. Um, the good news is we have decent research that shows that you can actually have some torn rotator cuff and, and, and torn, um, you know, uh, you can have an image that is imperfect, but you may not have pain. And we also have evidence that shows that you can, um, you know, you can, uh, you can have pain and not have anything wrong with your actual rotator cuff. Um, so just because you may have something wrong with your physical rotator cuff doesn't really mean that you need surgery or that it's going to get worse or that you ever have to have pain. And we kind of ease into it like that. Um, but I kind of always try to hear them out as much as, as, much as I can, because that's going to help my approach to educating them. Just like I want to know as much about their physical pain as possible because that will kind of guide me to modifying their training. I want to hear all about their thought process, what they know, what they think they know, where they learned it from, because that's going to help me best, best impact them. And I think too, with, when you ask questions like that, and when you use motivational interviewing, sometimes people will come to their own conclusions that you might've already been thinking. And you really raised a good point when you were talking about, um, you know, the healthcare professionals that say, maybe you should just stop this for a while. And, you know, the person comes to you and they say, well, I don't want to stop this because, you know, for example, me, I'm not going to stop lifting no matter what the injury is. I'm going to figure out a way to exercise. And Christina, your point about how it really just depends on the person. Are we trying to just keep someone active or are they specifically training for a certain goal or a certain sport? So how do we have to, you know, manipulate things in order to really be able to cater to that person's needs? And it, our beliefs are just so powerful in this whole process. And I was thinking about this the entire time you were using 10, 15 different metaphors, Nick, about how we poke the bear and how we set off our, our pain response. And our mindset and our, our psychology around exposure is so, so powerful. Um, I know that when I went to physical therapy the first time around, I did it in person. And it was just such a starkly different process than working with you has been. Uh, because the first thing that happened when I had my big flare up and I reached out to Nick and I said, I think it happened from the belt squat. 
and the first thing he said was, okay, let's get on the belt squat tomorrow. <laughs> and let's, let's try some belt squat with no weight. And I was like, so thrown off by that, but it's really so interesting how we can really just breathe ourselves through it. Like you said, so we get on the machine or we do the exercise. Maybe we start to feel a little bit of that pain response, or we feel a little bit of that stress coming on and you just breathe through it, tell yourself, okay, I, I can do this, um, you know, and over time we desensitize ourselves to that stimulus or to that alarm system. And it really makes you question, you know, what is this pain telling me? What is this pain actually? What's going on in my body? And I think that as you were segueing into, you know, there's evidence to show that you can have tissue damage without pain or vice versa, you know, what what is the evidence on that? Why don't you tell us a little bit more about what the disconnect is there? Because I think a lot of people don't realize that just because they've had this MRI or they've had this x-ray, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that's exactly what's causing their pain. And so when we get into the practice of that graded exposure and getting back to the movement that we want to do, why it's so important that our psychology is there and our mindset of I can get better and I can do this again is so important. Yeah, great question. And I want to just touch on one thing that you said before I, I get into that is uh, the, the idea that, okay, I think it happened on the belt squat. Let's get on the belt squat. Um, <laughs> kind of goes back to that, that stepwise approach that I was talking about where I like to take one baby step down away from the goal movement rather than 10 steps down and then try to work back up. Traditionally, and I, I speak for us as a profession, as physical therapists, traditionally we are, um, we underload our patients. We don't, we don't load them enough. And we typically take someone like you, for example, Marissa, and you come into my office and we'll say, okay, we're going to start with some bridges, some pelvic tilt exercises, some planks, some bird dogs, uh, and then kind of build your core strength back up. And then we can start squatting again once you're strong enough. That's, that's akin to taking nine steps down instead of taking 10 steps down because those exercises have their place if everything else fails. So if you can't tolerate the belt squat with no weight, if you can't tolerate a Bulgarian split squat, if you can't tolerate a body weight squat, then maybe, okay, let's start with some planks and bird dogs and some pelvic tilts and bridges. This way, at least we can load the system a little bit um, without provoking it. Uh, the problem, I think, and, and again, I speak for, uh, for us as a profession, is I think we, we start there rather than start up at the top. Um, so that's just kind of one, one thought that um, that I had there. And I'm, I'm guilty of that early in my profession too. So I speak from experience. Um, the, the next question is a very important question. And this idea that tissue damage does not always equal pain um, or pain does not always equal tissue damage rather. We have evidence to show that most people as we age into the age of 40s and, and 50s, majority of us will have some kind of pathology at our rotator cuff. Um, it is quite normal to have herniated discs in our lower backs. We've done studies where they take MRIs of random people off the street. And um, I always love that saying off the street, like as if like they're in like Times Square in New York City. And it's like, hey, they pull someone into an MRI machine. and like, <laughs> But, you know, just random people who may or may not have pain. And we find that it's actually quite normal to have some herniated discs, to have some tears in our rotator cuffs, tears in our labrums in our shoulder, labrums in our hips. Those are kind of some areas that are common to show up on MRIs that give people some, some fear. But it's important to know that it's not always um, the trigger for the pain. It, very, it may be, it may be um, the trigger for the pain. It's not that it never is. For example, if there was an injury, if someone was in a car accident, if there was some kind of acute trauma, if um, I had a patient recently who, uh, I guess last year, who was stopping their child on a sled because they were going into the street and they reached their arm back and they tore their bicep. Obviously, you can't breathe through that. That's pretty consistent that it's, tissue damage is probably the reason why you're having that pain. Um, so 
it's definitely, uh, there's definitely uh, kind of, you have to always remember that it could be um, B tissue damage, but for the most part, you, we can have those things and, and be asymptomatic. Even arthritis, arthritis is quite normal. I deal with a lot of patients that come in and say, oh, my doctor told me I have the knees of an eight-year-old. And I'm just like, oh gosh, like <laughs> we, have, we have work to do here. Um, it's just such a, uh, such a limiting thing to, t- to tell someone is that they have this progressive deterioration of their joints. And how, do you, how, does, that, how does that, the word empower is, is a little cliche, but how does it empower the patient to want to get better or to, um, to, to have a positive outlook on exercise and movement. If someone told me that my knees are bone on bone, the last thing I'd want to do is walk because I'm just imagining my joints grinding on each other. Um, so I think one of the ways I like to describe MRIs and x-rays and things like that, they're good to rule out red flags, fractures, God forbid, tumors, um, different things like that. We always want to rule those things out. But if it is just someone with this nonspecific back pain or nonspecific hip pain or shoulder pain, like we're talking about, an MRI is kind of like taking a picture of a car and trying to see if the alarm is going off. It's just hard to tell. We're just seeing everything that's ever happened to this person's physical structure and trying to determine if that is causing their pain. Um, Something like arthritis is a perfect example where sometimes I'll use, like we said, motivational interviewing and I'll say, okay. Um, when do you think this arthritis started? Ah, I mean, I've had arthritis for the past 30 years. Okay. But you've only had pain for the past month. And they're like, yeah, yeah. So, so then I say, well, how, why do you think that is? Like, do you think it's actually because of the arthritis or maybe just, there's some other things at play here? Um, and that kind of helps clarify some things that unless we have an MRI of the day before you started feeling pain and the day after, we can't really say that it is anything structural. Um, one of the questions I get asked with, with people who have been diagnosed with a herniated disc or a rotator cuff tear or any kind of labrum tear is, so will it, will it fix itself? Will it heal itself? Will my disc, will, my, will the jelly, right? The jelly scorch out the disc. Will the jelly kind of work itself back in the disc or will my rotator cuff heal or will, will my labrum ever get, get reattached? And I say, well, it may, but it may not. And then I kind of get into that conversation that we, that we just had. Um, so yeah, that's, that's important to remember that although it may feel like you can put your finger on that spot, that is the pain. I know why I have pain. I looked up this picture of the anatomy chart. I see the, the structure right there. All of that is, is playing into your perception of this pain. Um, so it may feel very real and very physical, but there is that chance that it is multifactorial and more than just structural. I think that's so important because it's, it's empowering to know that it doesn't have to be one way. It doesn't have to be, oh, you have a herniated disc. So now you are, you should ban yourself from doing X, Y, and Z exercises forever. And I think This is something that I experienced because when I got my MRI, I got an MRI last summer and that was when I actually found out that I had a herniated L4 and L5 and it was what enabled me to go to physical therapy for the first time. But with that, you know, herniated discs are something that we don't really have a lot of power of changing unless we want to go get surgery. And so I told myself, you know, you know, I'm not getting surgery. I'm going to keep training. I'm going to figure this out. So what you do moving forward from that diagnosis, if that's your starting point, is really what matters and what's empowering. Because ultimately, if you can't change something, the, the evidence there, especially around the herniated disc, I'm going to use that example because it's my own. Um, when I found out that there was plenty of evidence to show that high level athletes have herniated discs and they're asymptomatic and vice versa. People have symptoms without herniated discs. That was very empowering for me to learn about that evidence because then I knew, okay, this diagnosis doesn't have to define me. This is not defining my pain. I define my pain. And so that's when I started figuring out how to actually move forward and how to start working around the injury itself preach girl. Woo. <laughs> well, yeah, I think you guys 
both bring up really good points about how it's not just the physical side of injuries. It's that mindset portion as well. And so how you mentally are approaching the, the injury, what you're going to do about it and your outlook on it. And that can really make a huge difference in what your recovery process is going to look like. Marissa, you said, it doesn't matter. I'm training. Like I'm, I'm overcoming this no matter how much I have to do. So I think that that, I mean, that's huge. And I think that's really important for people to understand that you play a huge role in what's going to happen moving forward. Yeah. Sometimes, I mean, I've, I've, uh, I've had patients who felt better after day one and all we really did was talk most of the time. And uh, I'm not like a physical therapist from Hogwarts school of physical therapy, but it's more just, it's, it's shifting. The, it's a paradigm shift. And think of it like if, um, like uh, say, for example, you have a big event planned on, on a weekend and you hear that it's going to be thunderstorms and it's going to be bad weather for your event. You can spend that whole week upset about that weekend. But then it may be sunny, right? It may, the weather may change. But if no one ever told you that about the weather, objectively, your week would have been the same. But your perception of that entire week is completely different. So our mind has a way of, of changing everything about us. It's, it's, our, it's our perception of things. It's whether we, we laugh hard at something. It's whether we find joy in, in things. It's the, the lens that we view the world in is everything. So that doesn't stop with pain. The way that we view our pain, and, and, and both of you have, have said it beautifully, is that it, we don't, we're not defined by a pathology. And even just empowering someone, I'm going to use the word again, but empowering someone to do some kind of squat or do some kind of deadlift or do some kind of exercise, that is huge to someone like us where exercise is part of our lives. So yeah, I think not enough could be said about, about that paradigm shift where um, understand that you're not broken. You don't need to be fixed. You maybe just need some guidance, um, you know, and and uh, yeah, I think that's that's invaluable and and should be quite comforting for anyone out there who, who is dealing with with some pain. And again, we're, we're talking here, and and I want to make sure everyone understands that it's not always perfect. These things always don't work. Sometimes I've had plenty of times when I've worked with people online and or in person, and I've gone about it with my approach. And it's not really my approach; it's more just kind of a way a way of thinking. It's not like I've, I've coined this approach, um, but sometimes it doesn't work. And that's when we refer out. That's when we talk to colleagues. That's when, um, you know, we like Marissa, I like I, we, I reached out to some people um, when you asked me about um, uh, posture, right? We had a couple questions about posture and changing posture. I said, yeah, it's a good question. Let me see. Let me ask some other people. So when it doesn't work out, uh, you know, then we just kind of try other things. But for the most part, I think taking the principles of what we're talking about here can can really be um, life changing. I don't I don't say that um, lightly. I think it can be life changing if you kind of make this paradigm shift and view your situation a bit a bit differently. Oh, and we talked about stress perception in um, episode two, and so how again how you perceive your injury and how you're going to change your behaviors based on what's in front of you. And I think that one of the things that you kind of brought up made me think about. You know, sometimes we have clients that live these perfect lives. They don't have any injuries. They don't have anything. And then you have someone maybe who's like that, who's hit with an injury and they don't know what to do, um, that they've never really felt or dealt with any type of adversity before. And so thinking about it, um, and I'm sure Marissa doesn't want to deal with her, her back injury, but this is just another aspect of her life that can just make her a stronger person moving forward. And yeah, it sucks, but there are so many things that maybe if she deals with something again in the future and she's like, well, I know how to deal with this because I've done it before so I can do it again. 100%. And that is the goal. That is the end goal. The end goal is to learn as much as possible throughout this time. Um, the the one thing that I've learned, I've never dealt with this, any serious injuries, knock on wood, but the thing that I've learned in any aspect of life, whether it's a marriage, whether it's um, a career, whether it's a relationship with a friend, a parent, a brother, 
you learn most about yourself during the hard times. You don't have a need to dig deep inside and figure out why did that trigger me so much? Why did I get so angry? Why did she get so angry? That only happens when you go through hard times and then you get better from that. And then now that you've gone through that and you've looked inside and you found out things about yourself, then that won't happen again because you've learned from it. You've been there. You know what that's like. You know your triggers. You know, you know these nuances of the dynamic of your relationship, for example, if we're using that as an example. Same exact thing with your body. If you go through this process and you find innovative ways to train around pain, back to COVID, if you found innovative ways to train in your home, do pull-ups on a tree outside or find different ways to do exercises you know, without equipment, going through that process as awful as 2020 was, there have been some innovative things that have come out of it, especially with training, with, with people who train. We found ways to train that we would have never, ever, ever had to have found out without being forced to train at home. So sometimes being forced, getting this injury thrown at you or getting a, a lockdown thrown at you or, or a fight with a, a significant other, although it's hard in, in the moment, you have to believe that you're going to become going to come out stronger from that um, but that's all your mindset going into it you know any kind of mistake that we make any kind of hard time there's always always something to learn and I'm not just saying this because I read it in some book I'm saying it because I've made so many mistakes <laughs> and I've, I've gone through things like that and and it uh and it by the way I have a, I have a very happy marriage <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I always use that example, um, but it's perfect. It is a good example. I've been with my wife for very, very long time. We dated since high school. So the amount of things that we've gone through, we could have never made it this far if we didn't learn from our mistakes, if we didn't learn from things that we've had to have to be innovative with. And, and um, same exact thing goes with injury. So yeah, that's, it's a great, a great point is that use injury as a time for innovation. That is, it's something that, what else are you going to do, right? You're, you're either going to let it get you down or you can look at it and say, well, what else would I do sets of 20 goblet squats? <laughs> like, or, you know, or something like that and, and use it as, as, a, as a way to do something that maybe you would never do before and try to learn something from it. So I really love all of that because first of all, it just came from the heart and it was super passionate, but also it really just speaks to the message of this podcast. And we talk a lot about sustainability and how do we make this lifestyle something that we do forever for the rest of our lives. And I was having a conversation with a client who's also dealing with some, some back issues, some recurring stuff there. And one thing she said to me the other day that just really made my whole day was, you know, she's on the up and up from her latest flare up. And she is, she, she reported to me after a lift, she said, I just completed my lift to a T. I didn't aggravate my back. I'm so happy. And then she said, you know, I really don't think that I could appreciate the highs right mm -hmm. now, how I'm feeling if I had not gone through the lows. And so what you said about there's always something to learn in an injury. And Christina, when you said, you know, you learn how to deal with it and you, you get back up again. That's exactly what I said with my last flare up. I got my back just complete. It was so painful. Probably the most painful it's been it was torn up for about a day. And then I told myself, well, I've done this what feels like about 30 times, so I can do it again, and I will do it again. And so there really is something to learn and pull from every single experience. And, you know, maybe an injury is something that you're listening to this and you've been dealing with for a while, or maybe you're uh, dealing with your first one. Uh, but just know that if you're listening to this, it's a part of the journey. And I think with our expectations with lifting and fitness we got to remember that if we're going to put our bodies through this kind of stress you know this is going to be a part of the process and we're going to have those lows and then we're going to be able to really really appreciate the highs um and so you know for me having my 10,000th back flare up um or for someone who's maybe just dealing with something more acute remember that and and 
remember that your perspective is everything because if you remind yourself what you can do rather than you know what you're limited from or how this injury just gets you down you know you can really do a lot with that time and focus on things that maybe it's smaller movements that help to build up your strength maybe it's doing those 20 20 reps of goblet squats um, but you can always kind of put a positive spin on things no matter what you're going through yeah Yep. And, and one of the things that you just made me think of was um, the, when you said how this is part of the journey. And I think you're right. I think part of this journey that we all want to be on for the long term is understanding these principles of injury, of pain. Um, it, it's not so much like um, maintenance work, like a car or something where, well, if I foam roll every night, then I'll keep myself limber. Or if I do these four special stretches every night, then I'll be, you know, then I'm doing, I'm checking off that box for injury reduction or prevention. It's more just getting this paradigm shift. It's more just understanding the principles of injury, of pain management, of all of these things and having that in your, in your corner as you go on through this journey. And then you can use those principles for anything. Principles are, are solid. Principles are like, if I turn a screw right, it's going to go in. If I turn a screw left, it's going to come out. That, whether you choose to believe in them or not, they're present. Um, it's how you apply those, right? I can make a birdhouse. I can make a, 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 a toy car, I can, you know, it, but the principles are, are the same. So if, if that would be probably the, the message here is that the key to injury reduction or I don't want to say prevention, but the key to, to reducing injury and improving longevity in this game is understanding that though these principles we're talking about it's load management it's workload management it's it's un listening to your body it's, it's finding ways to to accept pain for what they are uh, for what it is and modifying and keep moving forward and if you can do that if you can get comfortable with that process i mean that that is that is the key to injury reduction i think it's funny that you say that too because we're kind of fed the narrative uh, as we kind of get into lifting or get into bodybuilding or wh whatever the people listening to this are doing, trying to just live a healthier lifestyle. We're fed the narrative that if you get injured, you did something wrong. Um, and if you don't get injured, it means you're doing something right. And I think a lot of times you can be doing a lot of things right or most things right or even everything right, but you might still run into that pain because I think it's it's so interesting how when we, when we do reach an injury or we, we feel pain, a lot of times it's because we're really pushing that capacity, right? We're not recovering from what we're doing. But how are we supposed to know that before we reach that point? So we have to learn th by going through it. And so we're never really going, unless you're completely sandbagging yourself throughout your entire journey, I feel like you have to run into these things in order to, to experience injury, learn what your capacity is, and then learn how to push that moving forward. Yeah, that's a great point. How just because you're not hurt doesn't mean you're doing things right. And just because you are hurt doesn't mean you're doing things wrong. It's like the guy or gal who gets on stage shredded and looks great. And you ask what they do and they say, oh, well, what I did was I, I filled my bathtub with tilapia the night before my competition. And I just took a bath in all the oils of the tilapia. And then, you know, and, and then I put mushrooms in it to get the striations in my legs. And okay, but like, <laughs> like I wish that, that worked. <laughs> <laughs> so, wait, no one else does that. That's just me. Okay. okay. Um, conversely, if you have someone who gets on stage and, and doesn't look, you know, it doesn't look that great. You ask them what they did and they say, Oh, well, I, um, I, I got Eric Helms' pyramids and I, I counted my macros and I, and I took a more holistic approach to, to this whole thing. And well, okay, maybe you just needed more time to get on. It doesn't mean that that was wrong. Right. So yeah, sometimes the, the out, the result or the outcome doesn't always mean that you're doing something right or wrong. Yeah. And that's interesting because we had, uh, one of the points on our outline was, what, what strategies do you employ for injury prevention? And it's just kind of funny because now we're saying, well, we don't really know if you can prevent an injury. You might just run into it and then have to learn from it and deal with it moving forward. Um, but I do want to just kind of pick your brain on that topic in general. So your title is the Injury Prevention and Management Specialist. 
um, you know, what tips do you have or what advice do you have for our audience, whether they're trying to prevent an injury or deal with injuries moving forward um, to make this journey truly a lifestyle? Yeah. So my title is Injury Reduction Management. Ah, uh, my bad. <laughs> or anyway, let's say uh, injury reduction and management specialist. specialist. That's okay. So it's okay. Every time, every time Eric Helms or anyone introduces me on a podcast, my title changes. So uh, <laughs> I basically, it's anything to do with uh, reducing injury without using the word reduction <laughs> or, or uh, prevention rather prevention. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I would say just learn to, uh, to listen to your body. Um, learn to accept that pain will, may, you know, pain may, pain is just a normal feeling, like we said, like hunger, like thirst. Um, so if we can get used to uh, understanding and looking at our training as that balance between load and capacity, and understand that it's multifactorial, um, if we can have that head on our shoulders, as we approach our training, um, that is that is the key. That is the key to dealing with this, and and not that it will prevent you from getting hurt, but it will it will prevent you from having this experience, this catastrophizing experience, and um, you know, and really bringing you down and preventing you from doing what you love. So, will will you feel pain at some point? Maybe, probably. But if you approach it in the right way, um, and you you ought to regulate yourself, and you understand, um, you know, you understand these processes that we're talking about, that is that's probably the the best advice that I can give anyone. And and that's it's not always easy, and that's why people like me or people like uh, Quinn Hennick or anyone from Clinical Athlete or Barbell Medicine, um, I mean, there are resources out there for you to reach out to and tons of free content, um, uh, tons of free content out there. So I would suggest number one is, is understanding these principles. Number two would be learning as much as you can about this stuff from these reputable resources. Um, look for people who don't speak in absolutes. Um, it's never always, it's never, never, there's never, a quick fix, um, a yellow flag would be trying to sell something. Not all the time, like we said, there are people that sell great, great products, but um, you know, just keep, keep that in mind. Anything from that we put out with 3DMJ, um, just kind of absorb it all like a sponge, reach out to me. Social media is a great thing. All you have to do is just message someone and and ask them a quick question and see if they would be able to shoot a couple emails back and forth or point you in the right direction with some resources. Marissa, there have been plenty of times that you asked me a question and I could try to answer it, but it may just be better to send you these three articles that say it way better than I can because all I would do is just say it not as good as these people did. So um, it, sometimes if you reach out to people, like, you know, for example, I love when people reach out to me. It's not a burden. It's not a nuisance. It really, it really is what I love to do. So, um, reach out to, you know, to reputable people, learn as much as you can from them, pick their brains. And, 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 and yeah, I think that is the combination of educating yourself and then making that paradigm shift. That's, that's the name of the game right there. Christina, anything you want to add? Well, there are a couple of things I wanted to touch on. So I, you brought up bodybuilding. And I think that you are able to relate to clients who are into that world. Um, so I think that that's really important for someone to be able to connect with you. And you had your pro debut in 2018 in the NGA. Is that correct? Yes. Um, and then you've actually gotten into judging natural bodybuilding too. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. If you want to tell us about that. Absolutely. Yeah. So I judged the Mr. America com uh, contest in, uh, in, in New Jersey. That was October. Um, so COVID kind of made a dent in it, but we were all there masked up and everything. And that was an absolute honor. I was uh, on a judging table with Philip Ricardo Jr., which was, it's always a pleasure to, uh, to, to talk to Phil. He's one of the greatest human beings. Uh, you know, just the second you, you approach him, he has this smile that's just the most welcoming smile in the world. Um, yeah, so it was with a lot of great people that weekend. 
it was uh, interesting to be on the other side of the stage. And uh, it's really, you get an appreciation for, for the sport a little more, I think on mm. uh, from that side. And uh, yeah, my, my bodybuilding um, career, I started competing in 2013. And like we talked about in the beginning, it, it was more very bro science. I just kind of wanted to get a pro card, didn't even know what that meant. <laughs> um, and then once, uh, once I, uh, once I kind of let go and, and understood that this is a journey and not a sprint and I don't have to get my pro card in my first year of competing and why why would I right like what would I do with it <laughs> um once I once I understood that this is um this is a journey and my my sense of self-worth is not dependent on what these judges think of me or who's standing next to me on stage because as you you all know we could bring the same exact physique to five different competitions and get five different placings depending on who's next to you there's mm -hmm. no objectivity about it it's just who's next to you if you're just being compared to the people next to you so once i realized that i kind of let go and i stopped um you know stopped worrying about the placing that i got and i just started looking in the mirror and trying to make myself the best that i possibly could and um you know lo and behold i ended up doing better in, in placing too when, when i did that as well so uh yeah, that's um, that is a little bit about my bodybuilding uh, journey, and then my how I got into the judging as well. That's really cool. So, Marissa and I, we just had our introduction episode come out, and I poked fun at my age a little bit because I'm older than Marissa. But I think that I think that you and I are the same age because you went to college in 2008, right? Yes. Okay, so so me, me too, <laughs> and <laughs> um, so that's one of the things I wanted to talk about because I had a very similar experience to you. Is that I, you know, when I was going to college, it was very bro science. It was very clean eating. You know, you can't eat white rice. You have to eat brown rice, <laughs> even though it's more easily digestible. But you know, <laughs> um, but I had that same kind of mentality and that was the research that I had got. I, I was big into Oxygen Magazine and we didn't really have Instagram <laughs> or it really wasn't a big thing yet. But I, I like what you've talked about before is that, you know, you started off your journey with this kind of bro science mentality and you had your mentors who told you certain things about, you know, physical therapy. But once you started to get a little bit more confident and you started kind of doing your own researching and reading. Um, I wanted to know maybe how your thinking or practices practices have kind of changed or evolved throughout the years or things that you've kind of gone back on and revised. Yeah. So I think um, one, one of the, the things that I've found at least is that, and we've touched on this kind of already, how we, there's always something to learn from, bad times or from mistakes. And one of the, the, the best, in my opinion, one of my, my better uh, blogs that I've ever written is on 3DMJ's website. And it's called, it's a two-part uh, monster of a blog. And it's called, uh, I am thankful for the mistakes of the past. And I broke down all of the things that we used to do in bodybuilding or, or I used to do um, and why they were wrong, but then what I learned from them. So for example, something like training to failure after every set and doing drop sets and rest pause after every set, just because, you know, I watched a video of Dwayne Johnson before I went to the gym or I watched a Ronnie Coleman video and man, if they're doing it, I got to do it. And and these natural guys don't know what they're talking about because they're not as jacked as them. Uh, those were the days. Those were the days. <laughs> um, I look back on those days like, <laughs> like, uh, like, like you look back on like uh, like high school, like and you're riding on the back of a motorcycle, and you're like, how did I how did I leave that in one piece? <laughs> um, but no, yeah. So uh, the for, so that training to failure all the time. One thing you can take from that is that I learned what it was like to quote unquote go there, mm -hmm. and I know what that feels like. So now that I approach training differently. I can use something like RPE very more, much more effectively because I made the mistake of going to failure and past failure every single time it picked up a weight. So now I know what that feels like. I know what being burned out feels like. I know what being just tired feels like. 
I know what, um, you know, I know what it feels like to buy a supplement because I was sold a narrative that wasn't true. I know what it's like to spend my lunch money that I've been saving on, um, uh, what the heck did I use? I don't know, uh, some kind of like creatine or something and thinking that I was going to become this monster of a, of a, of an athlete only to be let down. So I think that feeling, those feelings of, of training to failure and then understanding that it's not probably the best approach or buying that supplement and thinking that it's going to be the answer and then being discouraged and, and disappointed. Once you feel that, you can't unfeel that. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, I think those, those times are, 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 I'm glad that they happened. I'm glad that nothing permanent happened to me. I'm glad I didn't take any dangerous substances. I'm glad I never took any steroids or anything like that. Um, because obviously I wouldn't be able to compete in natural bodybuilding. Um, uh, you know, I'm I'm glad that I've made those mistakes similar to, like I said, like high school, like you do dumb things, but all you do is hope that you don't do anything too stupid. That's going (laughs) to last with you for the rest of your life. Um, so yeah, I think that, I am fortunate enough to say that I've made those mistakes and I've learned from them. And um, I think, uh, yeah, I think now that I take a more nuanced approach to things and perhaps a more evidence-based approach, um, having that experience in the past um, helps me be more confident in who I am today. Even physical therapy, like we've said, I've, I've learned what, it, what it's like to be that therapist who has the athlete come in and do clamshells on the table or do leg raises or do, you know, these lower level exercises and, and give the narrative of, let me, let me adjust your hips because I think that your your hips are off. Let me, let me do this manipulation and, and I can adjust your hips and then you'll feel better because of X, Y, and Z. Those words always came out of my mouth on a daily basis. So now that I know that feeling of, oh my gosh, back then, I would have stood on top of a mountain and preached that. That's how much for sure I knew that what I was saying was true. Once you feel that feeling of that being flipped on its head and you're like, oh my goodness, what, wh- how, could I, how could something as, as true as the sky is blue be, be, un, be possibly untrue? Now that mistake that I made helps me moving forward because the next time that I feel certain in something, I'm going to question it or go back to our relationship example, right? Say you were head over heels in love with someone and they were unfaithful. Well, that's going to next time you are head over heels in love with someone, you're always going to remember, okay, well, there's always a chance, right? Like maybe I shouldn't let my guard all the way down. Um, so the, uh, yeah, I think the, the, the idea of, um, of, of going there, making those mistakes and then, learning from them, I think it makes, it makes me anyway, it makes me more confident in who I am and more relatable to my, to my patients, my athletes, and also my colleagues that, that maybe are still, still doing those things. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, I, I, I made my handful of mistakes, but I think I, I'm grateful for them. I think as practitioners too, how do we know where the in-between is if we don't go to those extremes right so we learn by doing and by making mistakes just like with the injury process um as a coach you know i feel like and i've said this before uh if you don't look back at your practice three years ago five years ago and kind of cringe then you know that should be a red flag in and of itself because you should always be improving and always Mm -hmm. be reflecting and and making mistakes and then learning from them and figuring out where the nuance is no matter what your practice is one one of the things that i like to to use as a guide and, and i like to tell other practitioners is in this world of social media and everything like that it's important to not wrap our identities around things or techniques or um, you know, the, uh, the, the flashy gold thing that, that goes across our eyes. We don't want to be the, um, uh, let's see, what's an example? We don't want to be like the, I don't want to use this. This is the only thing coming to my head. We don't want to be the glute guy. I was just thinking that. 
no, but that's just what I'm with the first thing that came to my that's head. That's the first thing that came to my head. Too. <laughs> like we don't want to be, uh, we don't want to be the um, the doctor uh, doctor joint cracker. Like that, we don't want that to be on our in, our name on Instagram, or we don't want like uh, you know, we don't want our identity to be wrapped up in something like that because then, if evidence uh, comes out that may be a bit different or may show that it's not wrong, but it's not what we used to think it was. Mm -hmm. Because my livelihood is wrapped up in that, because I have five eBooks about how training the hips can help with knee pain, when evidence comes out that, yeah, maybe the hips are somewhat important with the knee, but really, it's really just loading the body with any kind of, of load to the lower extremity, regardless of whether it's the hip or the knee. Well, now I would look at a study like that and I would say, well, I don't like the way that sounds because I have five <laughs> books that say that my, that the hips are the key to, to ironclad the knees. Um, but that's because I, I wrap myself up in the identity of a, of a thing or a technique. Um, so I think we, by, by, by not doing that, by keeping our identities uh, away from those things, we're more likely to accept or, or look into differing opinions and, um, and kind of be less, less closed-minded and more open-minded because we have nothing to lose and everything to gain because like we keep talking about we don't want to ever think we know the answers we want to always keep learning and we can't keep learning if we're biased towards something or, or against something so yeah as much as uh as much as it, as hard as it is to not have a bias when looking at evidence and and, and research you know we have to try to be as unbiased as possible and it helps if we don't wrap our identity in things Definitely. I love that. Chris, uh, Marissa, I'm so sorry. I have a couple more questions. <laughs> so Nick, too, if you have time. Um, but you brought up Instagram and um, I feel like a stalker. But, um, you know, I went back and it looks like you started your Instagram journey in like the summer of 2017. Yes. And it sounds like Gary V was kind of an inspiration for that. Um, so I wanted to ask because you put out a ton of YouTube and videos and you've written a ton of articles and you'd mentioned at the beginning of the podcast that you reached out, um, to Tony and that was kind of your break in the industry. So maybe, you know, to hear a little bit about your experience with how social media can be beneficial, but how you shouldn't wrap yourself into an identity but maybe if you have any advice for something, someone who's looking to get into physical therapy and maybe the best way that they can present themselves online or how they can maybe get a break, if that makes sense. Yeah, I love, love that question so much. And yes, my Instagram, I was late to the game. Uh, I was uh, very late to the game. Um, Us I old did folks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, we have to. Yeah, we're uh, our generation. Wait, do you know that? You know that someone who was uh, someone who was like 28 was talking to me, and she said she referred to her generation as 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 my generation rather than our generation. And I'm like, wait, 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 like, wait, that a minute. Old. like, wait a minute, I like, I'm literally three years older than you. Like, we're in the same generation. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I was late to Instagram. Uh, I was, I was kind of against it. Like, like, you know how, like in the beginning when TikTok came out, everyone was like, ah, oh, these kids are just like dancing on TikTok. And now it's like this mammoth of a thing that like everyone's getting into. That's kind of how I thought of Instagram. And plus I, I got a smartphone late in the game too. So I was just a late bloomer and all that stuff. But then I realized, um, I realized the impact that I could have by getting to know these platforms and just by making YouTube videos and having my mom and my aunt watch them <laughs> didn't, wasn't, wasn't helping my cause, which is to kind of have as much of an impact as possible, right? So, um, yeah, so basically I, I had a lot of information that I wanted to get out there. And I, I, knew that, I knew that the product was good. I knew that I had real life experience in the gym. I knew that I had real life experience in the clinic. And I had this, this hybrid approach to, uh, that could really benefit athletes and, and kind of join the medical field and, and, and weightlifting and strength sports and physique sports together. So I, I had the product. I just didn't know how to, what to do with it. So I just started writing articles and saving them on my desktop without anywhere to, to send them or, or do. I was making 
awful videos in my parents' basement, like just <laughs> going like stumbling and, and stumbling over my words and like trying to figure out how to talk to a camera because that's tough when you're just starting out to talk to just an empty camera. Um, so I, I went through those processes with no intention of ever doing anything. I just felt the need to kind of get used to that just in case. So then I sent a bunch of articles out to many different people um, that never got back to me. Tony was having a, a baby at the time. His, his wife was pregnant and he said, I'm anticipating not having a lot of time to write. So if anyone would like to submit a guest blog, send it over my way. So that's when I sent it. So however old his son is, I always remember that's when I started to, uh, when I met Tony <laughs> Genoa. Um, so, so then, yeah, I sent him like three of my articles that I wrote and he got back to me, said he liked them a lot. He published them and I wrote for Tony consistently for two years. Um, and it was that moment that I realized there's something to this. Like I, I and I has nothing to do with getting paid or anything like that. I just realized I was this kid in my parents' basement trying to have an impact and the use of social media and um, and and just being well known in the industry, you can multiply your impact if you do this correctly and you surround and if you surround yourself with the right people so that's just what i kept doing i just kept grinding and writing for tony and then um a few other places too i submitted articles to and i write for nga uh, the nga's quarterly magazine um, and i've met different people through there so yeah advice i would say if if you're passionate about this stuff it's just it just flows. Like just keep going through the process. Keep, keep writing. If writing is your thing, keep making content, keep making videos if that's your thing. Um, and, and keep reaching out to people, reach out to people that you respect, reach out to people that have a platform that you think you can give value to. Um, you know, I saw in, in Tony's work that, uh, you know, he, he wasn't a physical therapist, so I wasn't, you know, trying to come to him with ice if he's an Eskimo, right? Like I felt like I could add something to Tony's cause. And believe me, when I sent my email to Tony, it probably took me five days to write a paragraph like this because I really wanted to make sure my message got across that this is why I'm doing this. Like I'm a longtime follower. I think I can help your, 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 uh, your audience. Um, and so, uh, so yeah. And then, just kind of keep reaching out to people that that you respect and people that you look up to and and it's true that people who were once celebrities to you can be friends and colleagues and that's exactly what happened to me with with 3dmj i feel closer to them than than anyone else in my life and and it's interesting because i've only met in person a handful of them um but uh but yeah i would say if you have a passion for this stuff um you know start small, keep making content, keep doing what you love, but do it because you love it. Don't do it because you're trying to get something out of it because, you know, that's similar to competing to win first place or get a pro card, um, you know, or, uh, or, or trying to be pain free throughout a, a lifting journey. It's just do it because you love it and reach out to people that you respect. And, uh, yeah, I mean, if you're in it for the right reasons, good, good things, usually come and I can say that's definitely what happened for me. I love that. I think you brought up some really, really good points and how you have to be passionate about it. It's not something that you just think, well, I'm going to do this because it's going to get me X, Y, Z. Right. I, I've never, I've never said, oh gosh, like I have to film this video or, oh gosh, like I have to write this article or, oh, like I have to jump on a call with this athlete. Like do I do this podcast, right? Like, this podcast. <laughs> you have no idea. Like when you guys sent me like the brief outline of some things we we're going to talk about, I'm like, Oh my God, this is like, I could talk for, this is going to be a five hour podcast. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, like the feeling that I have when I talk about stuff like this is it time, it, time isn't a thing. Like it, it just, I can keep going and going and going. Um, and that's what I found in my physical therapy practice too, is when I would have an athlete walk in the door and, or a weightlifter, I would be with that patient for like 
an hour and, and change and more. And I would not believe that that much time went by because it was, and I would just leave that interaction like floating on air because it just felt fantastic to interact with someone like that and impact a, a weightlifter. And I, once I felt that, I realized I need to make this my life because if I can do this every day, that is a damn good life. And, um, you know, I don't only treat athletes, I treat little ladies and, uh, and average Joes and, and, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, they're, uh, there's a few nuts sprinkled in every recipe, I think. <laughs> um, but no, yeah, it's, um, yeah, you, you have to, and we, when we say passion, it's, it's kind of a cliche, like empowerment, right? You got to be passionate about what you do, find your passion. But passion is, is that feeling like I'm talking about. It's when, it's when you just feel that, that like those butterflies in your chest, or you feel like, like when we hang up this call, I'm going to be amped up, like, my wife and daughter are going to be like, what just happened to you downstairs? <laughs> it's just going to be such a great feeling. And once you find that, whatever that is, whether it's like horseback riding or like making model planes, like whatever it is for you, find a way to make that your, your thing. And that's what I like about physical therapy is that the options are, are there for you. So if you do like working with we just stick with horses. You could be a physical therapist with horseback riders. Or if you're like me and like working with strength and physique sport athletes, you can make that your little like area of expertise. So yeah, that's what I would say is, um, is recognize the passion when you experience it. And then when you do, do your best to make that your career or, or your life somehow. That's awesome takeaways for people. Um, so you have kind of mentioned, um, you know, your, your why and your goal when it comes to dealing with patients and wanting to create that independence for the client or your patient, however you, you, uh, talk about them. And what I love is you'd mentioned that your why and, and why you do things is you're trying to improve the quality of life and inspire healthy living. So that aligns so much with, with the message that we're trying to put out, which is to make health and nutrition and a part of your lifestyle and something that is sustainable for the long term. So you do have that quality of life. So if there was maybe one thing that you could mention to someone or like a tip, what would that one thing be to be able to live a healthy lifestyle? Whew. Um... Loaded. Yeah. <laughs> One thing. <laughs> um, I would say, um, well, you mentioned the, the mission statement and, or my why. And when I started the, when I started my, my business with, with the online platform, that was what took me the longest to come up with because, uh, you know, learning the ins and outs of how to impact people online, learning how to treat someone online when I'm in a profession that I use my hands. Um, that was all well and good, but it was the why that I spent the most time on. Every single word it was, was thought out. Um, and, and in my, I have my most recent post on Instagram, it took me like three hours to write. <laughs> um, but it was me holding my daughter's hand uh, and I have my uh, t-shirt on from my company and it says, um, improve quality, quality of life and inspire healthy living on my back. And I think inspire is the key word there. And it's not, it's not teach healthy living. It's not promote healthy living. It's inspire healthy living and inspire means to breathe in, right? It means to, to take it in. And I think that only happens when we lead by example, just like you guys are doing. And just like I try to do is there are always people looking to be inspired. That is the reason why my Instagram exists. I don't post much personal things. That's the one time my daughter ended up on my Instagram, but it was because of a bigger purpose, not just to promote, show my daughter to the world. Um, although she did look cute, but uh, <laughs> um, it, uh, you know, it's, 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 in, it's about inspiring people. Um, and, and we only do that by, by walking the walk. And, and I guess if, if, um, if I could say, I guess one thing for a healthy, fulfilling life, it would be to, um, recognize what you're passionate about. Like we talked about, recognize those moments when you feel that, 
recognize the people you're around, recognize what you're doing, recognize who you're talking to, how you're talking, where, where you are. Um, and, and try to keep doing that. Try to keep surrounding yourself with those people. Try to keep doing that activity that you're doing or some variation of it. Um, and yeah, I think that is, that's the key, uh, you know, creating those moments and, um, and realizing what, what gets your fire going in. And, um, and of course, all of that is wrapped up in the ability to help people. I think if we can find our passion or at least recognize our passion, I don't know if, if we find it, I don't know if we're born with it. I don't know if we recognize it when it happens, whatever the terminology is, once you find that or, or experience that passion, find a way to use it to make people's lives better. And I think that is ultimately the key to, to a, a healthy and, and fulfilling life. Wow. Yeah. Um, I don't have anything there. <laughs> no. Um, so I think we, we did a really good job. Um, I know that we're running a little bit over on time, but um, just to kind of summarize and wrap up. So, you know, we talked about Nick, your background and your mentors, and then we kind of discussed what is um, an injury and what's normal pain versus um, something that might be considered more of an injury. Um, you know, what to do when you are having pain and experiencing pain, and then what your process is of dealing with pain or an injury. And we talked about rest versus working through or working around an injury. Um, we talked about graded exposure. Um, and most importantly, I think, is mindset surrounding injury and being able to shift your beliefs and um, going a, a lot back into your background. But um, if anyone wants to find out more about you or get in contact with you, where can they find you? Yeah. So that, well, first off, thank you guys so much for having me. This was an awesome conversation. Your questions were, were, uh, as you were saying the questions, I was like, uh, like ready to jump on them because it was just, <laughs> they're just very thought provoking questions. And, and both of you, I wish you nothing but the best, uh, with this podcast. Thank you for putting it together. Um, and it's an, a truly an honor to, to be here. So thank you guys for, uh, for doing this. Thank you for coming on. It was great. Of course, of course. Great having um, you. To, to reach me, you can go to 3dmusclejourney.com um, or you can go to my Instagram uh, at Nick Licamelli. I know you could direct message me, um, shoot me an email. I guess we could put my email somewhere in the show notes or, or, yes. or something. But uh, yeah, anything, um, anything I can do, any questions at all professional questions or questions about aches or pains or, or anything at all, just feel free to reach out. Yeah, we'll definitely have those in the show notes and we'll link the article The you know, I'm thankful for the mistakes in my past. I think that will be a good read. Um, but yeah, so again, thank you so much for coming on. So um, for those of you who are listening, we hope you enjoyed this podcast. And if you haven't already, make sure you're subscribed. Um, we'd appreciate it if you could leave us a rating and a review. Let us know what you thought about Nick <laughs> and his answers, um, if we should have him on again, and um, which I think we definitely will. Because we, again, we're the same way. We could talk for hours. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, leave us a rating or review, share this episode with a friend, maybe someone who has aches and pains. And you can find both myself and Marissa on Instagram. You can find me at Christy Lynn Fit and you can find Marissa at Marissa Roy Fitness. So thank you guys so much for listening and we hope to see you guys back next week.